a bunch of them from her. And uh, just to let everyone know we're also recording so that we'll be able to put this up on our YouTube page and et cetera. So uh, LA County, yeah, um, LA County, um, well, how many counties actually in California have done a breeding bird atlas or any bird atlas? Not very many. Uh, they, there's more than you think because some atlases have not been published ever. Same oh, okay. County did an atlas project, never published. Sacramento County, the same. But there are several counties in the Bay Area, three counties in Southern California, uh, Nevada County. Um, Alpine. Yeah. So there, there's a, uh, a, a small handful, maybe even a large handful. But uh, there's what fifty two counties in the state, so the mm -hmm. majority have not. Has Inyo done one? Uh, don't think so. I don't know. Hmm. Why would, except for the fact that they just simply run out, ran out of steam, or someone to actually do the work? Why would you not publish uh, your breeding bird atlas or your bird atlas? Because you don't have a volunteer that can do it. That, okay. Or is willing to yeah. devote the time to doing it. Right. I, don't, I did not keep track of my hours uh, writing that atlas, but it would. It took a number of years, like a lot more years than we anticipated. I wasn't working full time on it because you know other things came yeah. up. Yeah. And uh, but it it it's a lot of effort, and uh, it can be done poorly. It can be done <laughs> well. A lot of them yeah. in the middle. Um, yeah. But you know, you, you need somebody to, or a budget to hire somebody, a professional writer to do it. Right. But uh, there's very few professional writers that are also ornithologists that would be willing to just take that on because we're not talking uh, any kind of remuneration here as far as you know book sales or anything like that. You're not gonna right. get anything out of it. So of course. You're gonna, if you're a professional writer or ornithologist, you wanna do a popular title. Uh, that's where the money is. <laughs> Absolutely. To be quite frank. Well, um, let's go ahead and get started. We have, uh, we're starting to get um, some more people through so they can uh, catch up. Uh, I'd like, let me introduce everyone. Uh, first of all, I'm Ron Seiger. I'm the president of Los Angeles Burgers. Also with us tonight is Naresh Satyan and Susan Frank Gilliland. They're board members on for Los Angeles Birders and very active in this project. We have Ted Kyle, who is going to be helping us out with mapping and other sundry things. We have Larry Allen, who is our um, uh, our institutional memory. Is that uh, <laughs> our, pretty good? Yeah, okay, our, <laughs> definitely. You might recognize Larry's name, of course, as the primary author on the LA County Breeding Bird Atlas from 95 to 99. And also, um, I remember he made a really good tuna fish salad when we went out and worked on the Breeding Bird Atlas. And finally, we have the science chair of Los Angeles Birders, Lance Benner, who's actually going to be running uh, the show for us tonight. So take it away, Lance. Okay. Thank you very much, Ron. And uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us. Um, so this is going to be uh, different from the other Los Angeles birder uh, presentations and uh, webinars that we've had um, up to this day. This is really um, more of an informal kind of meeting. Um, we, I, I'm going to go over what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it, and when we're doing it. And uh, then we want to open things up to questions. Um, so um, we would appreciate it if you if you'd save your questions and comments and feedback and so forth uh, till the end of the talk or you can just pop things into the uh, I guess into the chat uh, and we can uh, we can go through them um, uh, after the uh, after the presentation the presentation itself I think is going to be relatively short I have less than uh, 10 slides so I'm going to start off with a PowerPoint where I discuss what we're doing 
And um, then toward the, uh, the, the latter part of the presentation, I'll switch over to the website that uh, Mark Scheel has very kindly set up that provides uh, all kinds of information about what we're doing and how, how we're doing it, the protocols and all that sort of thing. And, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll open things up for questions. So, so what we're doing is a, a trial winter bird atlas. Um, this figure here on the first slide shows um, 12 of the 13 blocks with uh, purple rectangles um, that we're hoping to cover. So what is it actually that we're doing and why? Let's see. Uh, here we go. So here's a kind of a, a big picture overview. Um, we're going to start this uh, next week on December 1st and continue it until February 15th of 2022. And so what is a winter bird atlas? It's a survey of birds in representative habitats across the county, in this case. Um, we're going to survey a subset of the more than 400 blocks that were covered in the original Los Angeles County Breeding Bird Atlas in the 1990s. We're doing a test run, uh, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Um, the data entry is going to use eBird, although in exceptional circumstances, we're willing to consider things like email and so forth, but primarily we want to use eBird. So why are we doing this? Well, we're in the very early stages of preparing for the second Los Angeles County Bird Atlas. The first one uh, that Larry was just discussing was conducted from 1995 to 1999 and was published by Allen et al. in 2016. Uh, it covered the breeding season. Um, within a few years, we will reach the 30th anniversary of when that atlas started. And so we think that it's time to start planning the second one. It's been a long enough interval now. There have been a lot of changes and we have a lot of really capable people who are able to, to help out with this sort of thing. We want to do th some things differently, though. With the second atlas, we want to also cover birds that are here in the winter. Um, we didn't do that previously, but it would be valuable information to have. Um, and to get a sense of, of just how useful that is, if you take a look at the San Diego bird atlas, they did that um, 20 plus years ago, and it was very, very useful. So we want to expand the atlas for the second uh, atlas effort to include both the breeding season and the winter birds. We're also doing this right now as a, as a test run. We want to do a small number of blocks, small enough that it's manageable, but large enough to cover the mass, vast majority of the habitats um, this winter to try it out and to test the logistics. Um, things like using eBird to uh to you know to get the data for data entry and to gain experience with extracting the data from eBird this and the extraction is primarily going to be be done by Ted Kyle who's one of the panelists on this on this Zoom meeting um we want to try to understand the complications of using eBird dealing with hot spots um we'll say more about that in a minute because some of the hot spots in the blocks are either just inside or just outside the block boundaries um we also want to get a sense of the level of effort that's required to do a useful survey. So for um, more information, um, this website down here on the bottom, um, if you click on that, which we'll, we'll look at it in detail in a few minutes, but that, that also summarizes a lot of the things that I'm saying. And a link to that website will continue to appear on numerous slides throughout the talk, including on the last one. Um, so if at any, of course, this whole presentation will be posted on the website. But if there's anything here that you particularly want to re record yourself, just go ahead and pull out your cell phone and take pictures. Um, that's a very effective way to capture information. So a little bit about the protocols. Um, really, this, it's quite straightforward. Um, unlike with the Breeding Bird Atlas, you know, there were all these detailed things that one had to do to look for evidence of breeding. We aren't going to do that with the Winter Atlas survey. Really, all you need to do is to identify the blocks, go into them, and survey the birds. Just do a regular, you know, complete eBird survey. You could do stationary counts. You can, you know, you can do uh, traveling counts as long as they're inside the block. Uh, you can do counts that cover areas. All of the, the test blocks that we've chosen have roads and trails. 
and they will be accessible throughout the winter, although there are a couple in the mountains where access may temporarily stop depending on snowstorms. Uh, and I'll show you what I mean by that shortly. Um, observations of the birds can be both visual or by sound. If, you, if you're uh, confident that you can identify birds by sound, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, please use eBird to enter your data. Um, enter them as complete lists. Uh, that's important because complete lists have a start and a stop time, and we need that because we want to track the level of effort, the number of hours that people contribute. Um, we're hoping to reach at least 20 hours for each block. We want to see if that's adequate. Um, the San Diego Atlas, a number of years ago, adopted 25 hours for the winter. Um, we think that might have been more than was necessary, but we want to test that. Um, so also, please count the birds to the best of your ability. Please don't just put X for the number. Um, please try to estimate how many there were. Um, incidental lists, um, they're OK, because but they won't count toward the 20 hour total we hope to reach. Um, but the species, if you just happen to see, say, a Harris's hawk and don't see anything else, we'd love to hear about it. Um, However, if you do find something rare, we do require documentation as usual. Um, and if there's anything that looks kind of weird, you may get an email from uh, one of us or possibly the eBird moderators. So as I said, the goal is to do 20 hours in each, each of the 13 blocks, um, ideally surveying the major habitat types. Um, I didn't write this here, but we're looking for 20 hours of daytime effort. Um, we aren't requiring nocturnal effort. We'd certainly love to have it. You're more than welcome to contribute night surveys. Um, however, we realize that a lot of people aren't comfortable with doing that. And some of the blocks are remote. Some of them are in places where there aren't likely to be a lot of nocturnal birds. So we aren't requiring it. Um, having said that, um, some of us are going to go out at night, particularly in the mountains, where I'm going to put in some effort to see what I can find. Um, so the next uh, next point, we as I say, we aren't looking for breeding evidence. Just document the birds. Just go out there, find find birds within the blocks, count them, and enter them into eBird. Um, with the breeding bird atlas, twenty five plus years ago, um, people were asked to sign up to survey individual blocks. For this trial uh, atlas this winter, we aren't requesting that. Uh, it's not necessary. Just go ahead and go into the atlas blocks, and um, enter the data and we will actually actually Ted Kyle will um, mine the uh, the eBird uh, data entry roughly once a week and we will post updates on uh, on the website that we have and um, have you know informal zoom meetings every two to three weeks to discuss um, our progress and to highlight perhaps blocks that might need attention or or blocks that are already done. Um, once some of the blocks are finished, we'll we'll put a notice on the website to indicate that. Um, so as I said, let's see, rare birds. Yes, if you find any rare birds, um, please document them as usual, photos, written descriptions, recordings, that sort of thing. Um, in terms of um, you know monitoring things with eBird, um, eBird, uh, one of the ways that it stores the data is in the format of a big, uh, what's known as a CSV file, which is uh, suitable for entry into spreadsheets like Excel. Um, and that actually makes it fairly easy to download the, the results and scan them because they give very detailed information about start time, end time, date, observers, um, the latitude and longitude of, of, the, uh, of the, the checklist, and so forth. And so uh, it turns out that Ted is a real whiz at parsing files like that. And so, that's what we're going to be doing to check how we're progressing. Again, here's the uh, the website uh, where we're going to post all of this, and I'll go through that in a few minutes. Um, I'll say more about this in a moment, but the, the last point on this slide, uh, we need to pay close attention to the location, your location, relative to the edges of the blocks. And the reason I say that, one, is because we don't want to count birds that are not in the block and put them in the wrong place. And in addition, eBird, for those of you who use it regularly, has hotspots. And some of the blocks have hotspots that are very close to the edges of the blocks. And that is going to complicate things. Um, and I'll show you some examples of that uh, shortly. 
So here is a, uh, a map. This is um, basically the, the same map that I showed you before uh, at the beginning of the talk with the trial uh, atlas blocks. They're, they're highlighted in purple rectangles. And um, I've also uh, put abbreviations uh, next to each one of them. So you can see which one is which. And they're, they're named over here. Um, uh, for the names that are on the right side of this slide, I unfortunately forgot to put the abbreviations, but I, I hope they'll be fairly clear. Um, for example, uh, CRYCW, that stands for Crystal Lake. Um, the NW, CW, CE, and so forth notation, um, that's a standard notation that's used in bird atlases across the country now, uh, particularly those that are utilizing eBird to facilitate uh, entering the data. Um, as you might imagine, NW stands for Northwest. Um, well, let, let me back up before I go into that. Um, so the blocks that are used in the bird atlases were originally taken from the U.S. Geological Survey 7.5 arc minute um, rectangles. Those rectangles were divided into six blocks. And so that's where our notation originates. Um, if you look slightly to the left of center in, this, in the, the map, which I don't know, maybe you hope you can see my cursor moving. There were two blocks that are close to each other, S-A-F-N-E and S-A-F-S-W. So those are both in the San Fernando USGS seven and a half minute rectangle. The one that says N-E is in the northeastern corner of it. The one that says S-W here is in the southwestern corner of it. So this is the only case on, on our test run where we've actually taken two blocks from the same USGS rectangle. Um, and, and I'll tell you more about why we did that uh, shortly. But the basic thing is that the, the notation here is that, so NW means Northwest, CW would mean Center West. So in one of those USGS seven and a half arc, arc minute um, rectangles, that would be a block in the center on the west side of it. As you might expect, the CE means a center block on the east side of the rectangle and so forth. NE is northeast and, and so forth. So this notation is different from the notation that was used in the 1995 to 1999 atlas, where we use the number system, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and on the, uh, the website for the Trial Winter Atlas, um, we, we mentioned the correspondence between this notation and the earlier notation that was used by, by the atlas published by Allen et al. So anyway, getting back to the blocks themselves, you can see they're spread um, widely across the county. They include habitats such as up here in the northeastern corner of the county that's in the desert, largely areas with creosote bushes and perhaps some Joshua trees. Over here near Lancaster, um, up uh, in the northwestern corner of the county in the mountains. Um, there's a Crystal Lake one that's off the north end of Route 39 in the San Gabriels, and um, some in suburban habitats like this one here in San Dimas, or this one in Pasadena, one in San Fernando. Uh, there are two in the Santa Monica Mountains. There's one over here in Topanga near the Getty Museum, Getty Villa Museum. Uh, there's another one over by Point Doom. Um, I put the, the abbreviation for that block there, but I forgot to put the rectangle on that one. Um, there's one in Southgate, one in Long Beach, you know, and, and so forth. So let's zoom in and look at one of them in more detail. This is the one in San Dimas, San Dimas Northwest. And on the website that we've set up for this trial winter bird atlas, we have a list of each of the 13 blocks. And each in, in that list, there are links that if you click on them, will bring up satellite views of each one of the, the regions. Um, and they're big files. They're between five and six megabytes. They're, they're PDF files. And uh, we did that intentionally so that you can see a fair bit of detail. This version that I'm showing here is a JPEG. And so the level of detail isn't as fine as you will be able to, to, to get from the website. So what this is showing you here, this, um, this is the 210 freeway right here. Uh, here's Route 57 going down there. This body of water here in the southeastern corner, that's the edge of Puddingstone Reservoir down in <coughs> the park. Um, uh, th this area here is part of Walnut Creek. That cat, gray catbird turned up a well, year and a half ago, was down around in here someplace. Uh, these are the South Hills, just uh, north of the 210 freeway. Um, you now here's some urban development with a Costco and a Home Depot and a movie theater and Walmart and so forth. 
So th this gives you a sense of, of what the individual, at least this particular block, looks like. Um, the, the blocks themselves are, are all at very similar scales, um, something like 3.6 by 2.9 miles. Um, and so let me say a little bit more about them. Um, say there are 13 total. The, uh, the Bird Atlas from 1999 uh, divided Los Angeles County into 12 larger regions. And the 13 trial blocks that we're using this year cover 11 of those regions. Um, the one region that isn't covered has a block that's right next to it, um, which I'll talk about momentarily. So they, they cover representative habitats across the county. And most of the blocks that we're doing this winter are in locations that don't receive a lot of attention in Ebert. And that is intentional. We want people to go to these places in part to see what's there. Uh, they, there might be interesting things lurking there that we just don't really know about because so few people go there. In addition, we didn't want to choose blocks where there would already be a lot of attention. You know, for example, the Paiute Ponds or Malibu Lagoon. We, we really want um, effort across the blocks and that we don't want everything to be dominated just by one really popular hotspot. So most of the one eBird hotspot in particular. So most of the blocks don't have hotspots that would that get a lot of coverage. There, um, there, there are a couple of exceptions, um, and we'll get to those. So again, the blocks are 3.6 by 2.9 miles. Um, there are only 13 of them, whereas the Breeding Bird Atlas published by Alan et al. from the 1990s, there were somewhat more than 400 blocks. So we're doing only a small fraction. And that's to keep the level of effort manageable. So the website that we've set up, uh, really that Mark Shield has very kindly set up, has some really nifty features, one of which um, are instructions for how you can see where you are when you're out in the field to tell if you are inside or outside a block boundary. And it turns out there are a couple ways you can do that. Um, so the LA Birders website, if you bring that up on your phone while you're out in the field, it has um, the Atlas blocks in a, in a Google map that you can see in your phone while you're out there, and it will show you where you are. Um, so that's really an ideal situation. And most of the blocks have cell phone service, except possibly for a couple in the mountains. Um, other options, if you're a little more savvy or want to try things differently, um, Ted, uh, Ted Kyle very kindly provided the KMZ files. These are files that um, you can load into Google Earth, Google Maps, and other mapping software that you know, outline these rectangles that I've shown in the previous figures. Um, you can download these onto a phone or onto a computer, load them into software like Google Maps and Google Earth and so forth, and see where things are, play around, zoom in, zoom out, and so forth. Um, another possibility is you can go to the maps on our website that I just mentioned, the, uh, the screen grabs, those PDF files, download them, and then print them out and you know bring them on uh, good old fashioned paper into the field with you. Um, of course, you'll still have to keep track of where you are relative to the edges, but, but um, that's a tried and true method that doesn't rely on something that might, you know, where the battery might discharge. So as I said, most of the blocks will have cell phone service. The one up at Crystal Lake is a, probably going to be an exception. That's uh, somewhat remote. And there's another one in the northwestern part of the county up near Liebre Mountain in Sandburg where the cell phone coverage might be spotty. Um, I keep talking about block boundaries. Please, please, please pay attention to where you are relative to those block edges. Um, and, and try to cover birds in your eBird list that are only inside the block. If you want to cover an area that's adjacent to the block but outside it, please use a separate eBird list. Um, and if, if eBird hotspots, uh, I left out the word hotspot here, if there are hotspots just outside the block, for the purposes of our trial atlas, please don't use them because your efforts will be put in the wrong place and they won't count. So just create a personal, a personal spot instead and use that. Um, so at this point, I have a note to myself to stop the PowerPoint and bring up the actual, um, let's see, how did I do this, uh, website so that we can see everything. Um, and 
And let's see if I can get this right. Okay, here we go. So here's the LA Birders um, website. So I hope you can see that. I just highlighted the, uh, the URL at the top. That's the thing I keep mentioning to you. Here is the top of the website for the Trial Winter Bird Atlas. And there's all sorts of information here. And there are two maps, interactive maps, that are shown. Um, this one right here is a street or road view. The atlas blocks are highlighted with blue rectangles. And the oblong round sort of buttons you see there are markers. Those are the symbols for the eBird hotspots that are inside those atlas blocks. Just the ones that are inside. If there are some that are just outside, they aren't shown. And if we scroll down a bit more, here is the same information, but with a satellite view. Um, again, using Google Maps. So um, we're going to start zooming around and zooming in with these um, in a moment, but I wanted to, to briefly um, show you those. If we continue to scroll down, there's more information here about the protocols, and it's, it largely repeats things that I just mentioned. It adds a little bit more detail. Um, <coughs> Uh, let's see, in case I didn't say it already, uh, we encourage people to just go and survey things. You don't need to sign up. Um, if you're going with a group, uh, we treat the timekeeping as similar to the way we do for Christmas bird counts. So if there's a group of several people, then they need survey an area for one hour. It's one hour of effort, not several hours. Um, seems self-evident, but that often causes confusion. Um, so... Again, here's the detailed information about the blocks. Uh, here's a nice table that tells the correspondence between the notation we're using now versus the notation used in the book published by Larry Allen et al. And in addition, it also very briefly summarizes overlap with the Christmas bird, Christmas bird count circles. So somewhat more than half of the regions we've chosen have at least some overlap with the Los Angel various Christmas bird counts in Los Angeles County. Now, three of them, there's only a little bit, um, like the one for Malibu, that's the Point Doom um, block, uh, the Los Angeles CBC, a little, a little chunk of the Topanga um, block in Pacific Palisades overlaps it. Um, and also there's this uh, one near Bear Divide, just north of Bear Divide, and um, that barely includes, um, is barely in, in part of the Santa Clarita uh, Christmas count. So and we, we have notes uh, about each of the blocks, a little bit about where they are, and then we talked a little bit about, about some of the hot spots and some of the, the potential for trouble. And so I think what we'll do next is we'll start actually going and zooming around. So we're going to look at the, the uh, version with the street view. And so you can zoom into things, and, and uh, let's see. Uh, Ron, could you verify that you are, in fact, seeing me zoom and move the map around? Is this working? Ron? Yeah, yeah, it's working just fine. Okay, thank you. So, for example, here is the block for Crystal Lake. And as you can see, there are three eBird hotspots shown with those blue buttons, blue markers. And this is one of those blocks where things are a little complicated because the bottom boundary splits the Coldbrook campground. And the eBird hotspot marker is something like 30 or 50 feet north of the edge of the block. But about a third of the campground itself is outside the block. So that's one of those places where if you decide to go birding there, uh, please try to pay attention to where you are relative to the block boundary to the best of your ability. Um, and count things that are north of the edge and not south of them. It's it's going to be tricky, and um, we're expecting to have some 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 glitches, some you know some some questions about this because it's it's going to be hard to tell, especially because there probably won't be any cell phone service up there. The other the other um, hotspots up here are are in places that are a little bit more straightforward. Um, I would point out though that if anybody goes here, most of the section of Highway 39. Um, basically west and then north of, um, of the turnoff to go to Crystal Lake. Most of that is closed, so you can't go up there, uh, just so you know. Um, 
in addition, the um, the dirt road that uh, goes away from the campground here goes out of the block and then comes back into it as it climbs up close to the top of uh, South Mount Hawkins, which is also just outside it. But th this is the, the one atlas block that provides access to truly high altitude habitat. And given that it's facing south, there's a pretty good chance that a lot of this will be accessible during the course of the winter. Um, south Mount Hawkins gets up to over 7,000 feet, by the way. And so that provides a chance to see things like Clark's Nutcrackers and, you know, Casson's Finch and Townsend Solitaires and so on. So let's uh, take a step back and look at some of the other ones. Uh, so this, this was the San Dimas block that I mentioned earlier. Let's have a look at the Pasadena block. That is the block that has the most eBird hotspots within its boundaries. And it also includes some hotspots that are going to be a little problematic. For example, this particular block, the eastern edge of it splits the Caltech campus. So here is Caltech uh, right about here. There's the block boundary. The Caltech hotspot is just inside the block. But if you, for example, went to the Athenaeum to have a very nice lunch and you saw some interesting birds, that's outside the block. Um, so this is a place where we're going to have to be careful. And, and this, this hotspot gets a lot of use. There, there are over a thousand eBird checklists from Caltech. Um, so that's going to be a bit of an issue. Um, some of the other hotspots in this, this area that get a lot of attention, uh, this, let's see, the one over here along the uh, lower Arroyo Seco, that's also had, I think, over a thousand eBird lists. Um, that one, however, is not near any block edges. Um, there's a one down here at Arlington Gardens. That's a nice little spot. And there are some other hotspots um, that don't get nearly as much attention up here in the northwestern corner, up around the northern edge, and uh, so forth. Um, another another uh, block that I want to highlight is this one in San Fernando. This is the San Fernando, I believe it's the northeast block. And um, this one was chosen in part because it includes uh, the Bear Divide site on Little Tahunga Canyon Road. Um, Bear Divide is right here. Um, I hope you have uh, been able to see some of the presentations that Ryan uh, uh, whoops, has been giving us um, about efforts to monitor bird migration in Bear Divide. And so I think, so Kimball chose this, this particular block and I think Part of the reason why is so that we get some some attention, some coverage up here during the winter, so we can see what's going on. Um, otherwise, normally there's very little attention up here. The, the The block itself includes more than just Bear Divide, of course. It also includes part of Sand Canyon, part of Little Tahunka Canyon. Uh, note that the road changes names here at the Divide. Um, it does not, however, include Veterans Memorial Park, um, which is a well-known place for sap suckers in the winter. But if you were to start there and, and start going up the dirt roads, it does include this area up here, as well as if you go to Bear Divide and continue on up the road, there's a fire station up here and some antennas and so forth. That's all within the block. And a little sliver of this running roughly in the northeast, northwestern corner is also inside the Santa Clarita Christmas Count Circle. So I'll, I'll talk about a couple more and then we'll stop this and we'll open things up for people's uh, questions and comments and and a suggestion. So um, the point doom block, uh, this was the, the last one that we added. It didn't appear on on uh, one of the maps I showed earlier. This is another one where the hot, eBird hotspot locations are going to be a little tricky. Um, the point doom block does not include the tip of point doom. So that's one thing to keep close attention to. So if you do a sea watch at point doom, and if you're right there at the tip of the point, I'm sorry, but we can't count it. However, if you're here on Point Doom Beach, we'd love to hear what you find. Um, similarly, if you go over to the west, um, over here along the shore of Malibu, uh, unfortunately, a good chunk of Mat El Matador Beach is outside the block, but a little bit east of there is inside it. Zuma Canyon is going to cause some, some headaches too, I'm sure, because the parking lot for Zuma Canyon is right here under this little symbol of a hiker and that's where the eBird hotspot is located it's right in here so the hotspot at Zuma Canyon is just outside the area that includes most of the trails so 
if you decide to go birding in Zuma Canyon, which we would encourage, um, please just enter a personal eBird spot um, for contributing to the Winter Atlas. Um, and of course, we yes, we do realize that uh, Professor Walter Sakai and his team regularly banned birds here, I think rough every three weeks. And uh, so we need to contact Walt to find out um, what he's getting. And, and Kimball and Larry and I need to talk about how we're going to handle that, that sort of stuff. Because I know Walt sometimes enters his records into eBird. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll deal with subtle issues like that later. But this is a, a, another area where we need to be concerned a little bit about where you are relative to the eBird hotspots. And um, please don't use the regular eBird hotspot there. So uh, the Southgate block is over here. This is kind of in the urban heart of Los Angeles. It includes a very small sliver of the Los Angeles River. Um, unfortunately, not quite where that wagtail turned up um, a year and a half ago. It's about a quarter mile northeast, northwest of where the wagtail was. But there are a number of parks like Salt Lake Park and some other ones here that have produced things like spotted doves and Inca doves and um, all sorts of intriguing things. Uh, Dick Barth is particularly good at finding rare birds in places like that. And then finally down here in the south, the Long Beach block includes the Long Beach Airport. Um, it also includes Signal Hill. And the area in here that gets the most attention um, is probably right over here at Hartwell Park. Um, uh, hold on a sec. The sprinkler just turned on. It's kind of noisy. I'll be back in a sec. Just going to close the door. Okay, back again. So... I, I invite you to check out the website um, and uh, have a look at it and, uh, you know, scroll around, see what's there and um, download the maps and play with the KMZ files. So the, uh, let's see, let me start this up again. So we're back to the PowerPoint. And so again, here is uh, again, the link to our, our, um, our website. Uh, if you have questions, you're welcome to email. And uh, finally, on a completely different subject, um, I, I really have to mention this. Um, in just under three hours, NASA is going to launch a rocket from Vandenberg Air Force Base. Um, it is NASA's Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART, spacecraft mission, which is going to rendezvous with and impact an asteroid next September. That launch happens at 10.21 p.m. tonight from Vandenberg Air Force Base. The weather's pretty good, and you should be able to see this from across Southern California. Um, so look over to the southwest, 1021 p.m. <laughs> if, if it turns out they have to scrub, they'll try it again tomorrow night. But so far, the weather looks good, so I think this is going to happen. So go DART. And in the interest <laughs> of full disclosure, I'm one of the people on the DART science team. Um, we, we have observed that asteroid with radar um, previously, and we're going to observe it again with radar next year. So with that, um, I will stop the uh, stop the presentation. And uh, let's see if we have uh, any uh, any questions or, or feedback from anybody. Well, um, actually, I had a quick question just to make sure all the information you just gave in your presentation can be found on our website. Is that correct? Or should we also yes. put Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's it's all there. And, and, and the website is uh, is not final. We're going to um, we're we're going to you know update it, add to it, improve it. I'm sure we'll think of things that we forgot previously that we wanted to to add to it. And yeah, I see Kimball that you're there. If there's anything, in fact, Kimball's hand is raised. So Kimball, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us what you're thinking? Um, no, I was just going to I was just going to mention two other points. Um, one is that this trial, of course, is just one winter, and as everybody knows, some of our wintering birds uh, vary radically in their abundance or even their presence from winter to winter. So in the true winter atlas, we will probably work out a way to require coverage on more than one winter, or ideally every winter through the five-year period. Because, for example, in this trial winter, there's like no red-breasted nuthatches moving relatively few, you know, crossbills, pine siskins, other things, um, whereas a few other things might be on the move. And so we recognize that in one year, we won't capture 
the true winter ebb fauna that might be in a given block over a several year period. So um, don't worry if you don't find some of these eruptives in this year. The other thing I wondered, and I guess we should have talked about this before, is as you know, David Bell is the hotspot coordinator for LA County, and we might work with him to actually create Atlas specific hotspots where there are troubles with existing hotspots, um, which would, the nice thing about that, it was, would let everybody enter their data into one hotspot instead of a zillion scattered points all mapped in a relatively small area. So we might be able, you know, for example, the problem with Zuma Canyon, the upper hiking trails being um, in a hot spot that's actually outside the block, we could create a, you know, P Point Doom Southwest Atlas Zuma Canyon hotspot or something like that that people could use that they would know safely was mapped within their boundary. So we ought to, we don't need to pursue that further right now, but we ought to talk to David about the wisdom of yeah. maybe creating some of these hotspots <clears throat> for the Atlas. Absolutely. Absolutely. David's uh, our newest lab board member. And unfortunately, I don't think he's with us tonight, but uh, we'll definitely, definitely tie into that. Um, Kim Moore asked quickly, um, will you automatically scan eBird uh, up, uh, scan eBird to pick up lists or will, uh, and will this include personal hotspots? Or do we, or do we have to notify someone that we have actually birded in the spot? So you don't need to notify us. Um, we will actually be checking eBird regularly. So, um, as I, uh, I, I tried to mention earlier in the talk, one of the ways that eBird stores their data is in a big file that you can upload into spreadsheets like Excel. And so we can download that file and we're going to on, on regular intervals, roughly once a week, and then we will scan it. And we'll just do it for the whole county and we'll scan it to identify eBird checklists um, that fit within the each of the rectangles. And so it, it's just going to happen automatically. And that's one of the, the beauties of using eBird to do this is it's so much easier than writing out things and, you know, on data cards and sending it in and transcribing it and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, mm -hmm. no, you, you, you won't need to, to tell us. We, we'll, we'll see it. Um, we'll, we'll definitely see it. Sounds great. Lily asks, which hotspots do you think are uh, have the least amount of attention? She might actually mean which blocks have the least amount of attention. Um, well, I think that block in the northwestern corner of the <laughs> county, which had one hotspot with very few checklists, uh, that one's hasn't gotten a lot of attention. The one in the northeastern part of the county hasn't received much attention either. And the one in Lancaster, the coverage, the interest there has been pretty sparse. Um, the one, um, let's see, is Pacifico Mountain. It's along the Mount Emma Road and the Angeles Forest Road. That one also has pretty sparse coverage. Um, a, a couple more words about some of those spots, things that I forgot to mention before. Um, the one along Mount Emma Road, that's the Pacifico Mountain spot. Part of why I chose that is because it's the only one of the blocks that includes habitat with pinyon pines. And it's also, you know, somewhat on the north slope of the mountains. And so we, we wanted to get some coverage in as many habitat types as possible. Um, and ideally places that at least you know, haven't burned recently. Like there's some good pinyon pine habitat that got fried in the bobcat fire last year. We, we actually did not choose locations with a lot of recent burn damage there, from the, especially from the bobcat fire. The, um, the Atlas block in the northwestern corner, the one at Liebre Mountain, which is just south of Quail Lake, that one is the only block that has both gray pines and valley oaks in it. Um, and it's also a place with some open areas where there's uh, a pretty good chance of seeing California condors if you linger long enough at the right time of the day. Um, it gets very little attention. There are some roads up there. There are some trails. Uh, and... Um, I think you know there could be some interesting things there. Um, we already talked a little bit about Bear Divide. Uh, the one at Crystal Lake, um, I chose that one because I wanted to have at least one block that was in the mountains, but was in a place where the road is likely to be open for most of the winter. So we didn't choose Buckhorn because sometimes the road closes, or we didn't choose you know Dawson Saddle because the road will almost certainly close. Um, okay. Other question. Yeah. 
Gregory and Kim kind of have similar questions. Gregory asks, how are eBird lists distinguished from those working on this effort versus those who just happen to be up there birding and putting an eBird? And Kim asks, how are the 20 hours in total? How are the 20 hours in total for all people or, and, or does this include random birders who just happen to enter a list? Um, so, okay, I'll do the second question first. Uh, the yeah, the, the time that's uh, you know that's accumulated will be for everybody who goes there, um, regardless of whether they're even aware of the winter trial atlas or not. Um, because of the way that the eBird data are stored and the way that we're going to scan the files to extract the eBird records, we'll see it even if people have no clue that this is happening. Um, and so, what was the first question again? Um, how are eBird lists distinguished from those who are working on this effort versus those who just happen to put in an eBird list? They aren't. They aren't. And we realize that in some situations, this could cause some trouble. For example, um, there are some eBirders who unfortunately will enter eBird lists, you know, with that cover 20 miles. You're not supposed to do that. Um, eBird prefers you keep your list to five miles or less. Um, and if there are situations where there are lists that cover 20 miles that go through that are in a, one of our blocks, then yeah, we're going to have to deal with those on a case by case basis. And we're, we're aware that there are going to be issues with things like that. But if there's somebody who goes to a block and just, you know, counts birds for 10 minutes and it's in, you know, it, and it's within the block, no problem. We're, we're, we're delighted to have it. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Um, Kathy asks, it seems like using hotspots can be problematic. Would it just be easier to make a personal spot um, within the quadrants for the entry? Uh, you're certainly welcome to do that. Um, I know that, so I mean, wh what we're doing with this trial atlas and, and what happens with regular eBird usage is a little bit in conflict in the sense that generally there's a preference with, with you know, with regular eBird usage to use hotspots. But, you know, as Kimball just mentioned, we, we might consider creating specific Atlas hotspots that are, you know, within the, the actual blocks. But if you want to do personal spots, eBird is loaded with them. I mean, there are just enormous numbers of them, and quite a few of them in LA County are mine, um, that, you know, are close to eBird hotspots, but they predate them, so I never change them. <laughs> yeah. if, if you put in personal spots, we'll see them. Those will be fine. Great, great. Uh, Meryl actually asked a good general question. Why? Did, uh, why? How did you choose the blocks you chose? Um, his question specifically says, "Why did you choose this um, the one one of the blocks in Long Beach because it's actually pretty well covered, etc." But can you briefly talk about how you chose the blocks? Um, Kimball, you want to take that one? And, and I'll follow up with a few that I chose after you speak. Um, yeah, it was, a lot of it was just kind of random. I mean, we tried to scatter them around the county. We tried not to include blocks we knew would get lots of coverage anyway, as Lance mentioned. Um, you know, for example, the lower LA River that the Merrill asked about is mm -hmm. covered, you know, multiple times every day. So we don't <laughs> think we're going to learn much about how to cover a block by including that. And of, of course, the, the important point is that all these will be included when we do the true winter atlas, when we start the, the major atlas project. So it's gonna cover the entire county. So we won't leave anything out. But I just tried to scatter some, some we wanted to make sure there was at least some access to all of them. Um, we purposefully chose some that have very little coverage. Um, Lance was talking about the Pacifico mountain block that's along Mount Emma Road. Um, I actually drive through that block twice a day every day, but I don't stop. And in fact, I might get killed if I tried to stop because of the way the traffic runs along Mount Emma and Angeles Forest Highway. But on weekends or at the right time of day, it's certainly worth covering and I'll, I'll plan to do that. Um, and it does have some pinions, although much of that burn, not in the Bobcat fire, but a little bit in the station fire in some earlier so it's not the most luscious block in the county but there's going to be a lot of blocks that aren't all that exciting but they all need to be covered and so 
Yeah, we just tried to scatter things around, but not choose blocks that already we know had lots of coverage. And frankly, when we chose blocks somewhat randomly, we didn't look at them carefully to look at the kinds of problems that might yeah. um, ensue. Um, although those problems, this is why we're doing a trial is to work out those problems. So I know that, for example, um, as you mentioned, Hartwell Park is divided so that only the western part of the park is in that Long Beach block that we're doing. And so we'll have to either use personal hotspots or create an atlas, hot, personal spots or create an atlas hotspot for that. And we recognize that a lot of the most heavily covered parts of Hartwell Park will be outside of that. So that's fine. Again, this is just a trial. So yeah, to, to add to that, um, after we, we had originally chosen 12 blocks and then we realized we didn't include the coast. And so uh, Kimball suggested a couple of, uh, of other ones and then we chose the one out by Point Doom. Um, and uh, so, yeah, there's actually a question about the coastal block. And uh, yeah, we, we want to count the birds that are offshore too, um, as long as they're not outside the block boundary. And from that particular block, I suppose on a really clear day, you might be able to see something blocked beyond the block boundary. Um, but you know, if it's like three miles offshore, uh, please don't count it, but it, there probably aren't a lot of birds that you could really identify at that sort of distance. Um, but you know, if it's a half mile offshore, sure, please count it. Um, doesn't have to be just land birds. Um, let's see another question. What if we exceed 20 hours? Oh, that's no problem at all. Um, yeah, there, the, for some of the blocks, there might be a lot more, especially the one in Pasadena. Um, I'd be very surprised if there aren't. And, and in particular, as I mentioned, some of the Christmas counts overlap and that could well contribute significantly to some of these blocks. Um, kind of hoping that it will, in fact. Yeah. And Carol kind of wants a little cl clarification. Does 20 hours mean all at once or is no. that over multiple trips? No, no. Ideally spread out over the winter. Um, yeah. In fact, it might even be multiple people. Oh, it should be. Yeah, because we're, we're not asking, you know, any individual person to volunteer to cover the whole thing. Um, that, that that's intentional. We really want a lot of people to get involved and to give it a try and uh, and to contribute. And um, you know, again, as I mentioned, I've been doing atlasing and for the main both breeding and winter bird atlases. And although people there are adopting blocks, they're also doing what they call poaching, where you just kind of go in and do things. Particularly if some of the blocks are languishing. And uh, so I've been doing quite a bit of that. Right find some block that someone volunteered to cover, but they aren't really covering it very much. And so I've just gone in and done it. Um, yeah. So and, yeah, please feel free. And Ted kind of added uh, onto that, uh, the more the merrier, uh, obviously, the more people that cover a block more hours, the better that block is covered. And that's a good thing. Um, I think we're out of questions. I want to ask the panelists, uh, I know that all of you have a lot to add, but do you can does anyone want to add something to this effort? Larry, you probably are, um, you might have some words of wisdom for us. Well, um, I can, I think I'd like to echo Kimball's suggestion that we do set up a hot spot for in the center of each block. Although of course we want people to cover all the habitats in the block. And I don't recall from reading the, the uh, uh, the website whether people are uh, actually encouraged to cover examples of each and every habitat they find in the block and it's important they do so because yes. you know that of course that birds will vary depending on where you are so it might be not be so so problematic in say high vista one out there in the northeastern county but if you get into uh especially the urban areas that are that are adjacent to foothills you can uh, spend a lot of time on your on your favorite hiking trail up into the mountains and then totally ignore the urban areas you you'll miss uh, you'll miss rock pigeon for example <laughs> <laughs> and house sparrow even though they're in the block because you spend all your time in the interesting habitats so if there's this particularly boring half or you know quarter of your block be sure to spend some time there. That's Ted? my advice. Did you want to say anything, Ted? 
Uh, yeah, just as a reminder too, if you're birding as a group, please be sure to share checklists amongst the group um, and not have everybody just enter their own checklist because that could potentially skew the hours. Good point, good point. Yeah, and, and for those of you who, who aren't familiar, uh, um, Ted is, is a real whiz with the Wisconsin Bird Atlas and has been mm -hmm. providing invaluable help <laughs> in many ways. So thank uh, you. I, I just helped I just helped with Wisconsin as a point counter and atlas or I didn't actually help with the <laughs> actual data aspects. That was all Nick Walton and Nick Anage. Okay, great. Great. Uh, anyone else on the panel? Uh, or anyone else on the audience? Well, I just want to thank everyone for doing this, especially Lance. Um, thank you very much for putting all this together. We really appreciate it. And uh, if you, anyone has any questions, uh, Lance did include his email address. Uh, one actually, one question did pop up. Um, will there be updates to how much a block has been covered from question from Kathy? Good question. Yeah. Yeah, there will be. Um, so we're going to do that in, in, a, in a couple of different ways. We're going to update the website on a regular basis, uh, roughly weekly. Um, and so we're going to expand the website um, so that information will be listed for each one of the blocks. For example, tabulating the different species by name that have been found, um, the level of effort, how many hours have been put in, how many checklists, um, you know, that, that sort of thing so that um, we have a sense of, of how, how we're doing. Um, in addition, as I mentioned, we're going to be uh, doing more of these uh, Zoom meetings uh, roughly every two to three weeks. Um, I say roughly because, you know, the holidays <laughs> are upon us, you know, Thanksgiving is coming up and, you know, the end of December, everybody's busy. And so, um, but we'll, we'll try to do at least one, one session before, you know, Christmas comes along and, um, and, uh, you know, see how we're doing and then continue doing them probably continuing until shortly after the middle of February to, to sort of wrap things up. Um, great. Also, Kathy. Oh, um, Kathy, um, the actual dates for this trial are December 1st through February 15th. And for anyone. And again, if anyone has any question, Lance did put his email address on there. You also can go to the LA Birders, LABirders.org website. And we have a contact button to feel free to contact us and we'll be monitoring that and send the question and take care of the question. Um, and, and I think that's it. Thank you to Lance and thank you to everyone who was on our panel. John, did you have anything to add or are you just hanging on there? Okay, I, I think John might be busy. Okay, um, thank you all very much. And this, uh, <laughs> there he is. And this will be going on to our website for, uh, for further uh, so that you can take a look at it in the future. And thank you all very much. I'll see you all in the field. All right. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. Go dart. <laughs>